Happy Sabbath, everybody. I'm so excited to be here to see all of your faces. Thank you, Caleb, for reading the scripture. If I read it, I wouldn't have any voice left. The fig leaf dilemma. Based on Leviticus 19. I'm going to share with you some descriptions. Okay? And the kids will probably figure it out before the big people. But if you know the answer, just raise your hand. Because some of you might figure it out, like Maddie might figure it out right away. So just raise your hand if you know the answer. Don't say it so that other people can enjoy the suspense if they're not as quick as you. Okay? If you know the answer, just raise your hand. All right? All right. First description. The less functional I am, the more I earn. No hands? All right. Another one. When I'm tiny, ignored and abhorred I am. Once grown, never forgotten and spoiled rotten. I'm very seldom alone, for I mostly hang with my own. I'm forced to conceal but after a, after a wedding, I reveal. All right, we got Mason has an idea. Don't say it, Mason. I love to dance with the wind and with the waves. I cause great headaches for parents on Sabbath morning and the first day of school. All right, we got another one. Okay, we got a few more. It was that, that headache for parents that got the most hands up. Okay, let's, let's see. Here's some more clues. What supplies a bully with material when he's targeting that one kid at school? What incites embarrassment quite often, especially when it's unintentional? What fosters animals to become extinct? No, hand, no more hands? All right, I'll keep going. What embellishes idolatry? Certain religions, especially the ones in the area of anime. What conceals racial terrorism? What facilitates school shootings? What eases gender modification? What is quite necessary for hijacking a plane? What is essential for shoplifting? Any more hands? Clothes. Is that what you're thinking? Is that what you're thinking? Who had the third hand up? Is that what you were thinking, Wyatt? No? Okay. Well, it's clothes. Clothes do all of those things which explains why I'm wearing my favorite shirt. I wear it every five years. <laughs> the last time I wore it was to my daughter's Victorian tea party. I think she was eight or something. And then today I said, oh, I get to wear it again today because I'm talking about clothes. Shotness. Who knows what that word means? Who here studied Hebrew? clothes that's that's right and what's the rest of it clothes that 
are mixed and mingled in their fabric. So there's, there's and, and let me go to the specific verse. Leviticus 19, 19. You go all the way to the bottom where, where the colon is. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and wool come upon thee. So this was a statute from the Lord to the Israelites found in Leviticus 19. Among all those other rules about how to treat strangers, about how to plant seeds, about how to eat, about what to do, what not to hire your daughter as, all of these rules. And, and by the way, when there is a rule in the Bible, at school, at work, don't be offended, like me. You know, when, when I was in school, I can't remember what grade, the teacher came in and said, all right, kids, no more playing on the, on the, on the merry-go-round for one week. I was like, what? Because you can't avoid peeing on the merry-go-round. So one kid thought it was cool to pee while the merry-go-round's going in circles. And I was offended because I couldn't get on the merry-go-round. So don't be offended when you hear rules. Rules happen and occur because somebody did something, even if it wasn't you. But anyway, so there, when I was researching this verse, and I was trying to figure out, what does that mean? I can't wear clothes. If you look at a label, most clothes have like two or three ingredients, right? What does that mean? So I found three theories or three scholastic opinions. Number one, it represented God's people not marrying, not having relationships with the heathens and the pagans and the Hittites and the people around them. That was one interpretation. Another one was that it represented the history of the Hebrews that came from Egypt and were now in the wilderness or the desert. Because in Egypt, the, the two products, one comes from animals and one comes from plants, right? The wool and the linen. So in Egypt, they had the Nile, they had water, they had irrigation. So that's where the plant products could come from. In the wilderness, it was the animal skins or the, the, the sheep's wool. And so it was saying, you have come out of Egypt, don't go back. And then there was a third scholastic opinion. What was that opinion? Oh, the third one was that the priest, the Jewish priest, their clothes were able to be mixed materials and ingredients with precious stones and different colors and different dyes. So if you weren't of the holy priesthood, you should not be wearing these clothes. But that's an interesting chapter and verse. Now, why are clothes so important? Number one, you wear them most of your life, at least in the US. You wear them most of your life. Number two, it's the only thing that's going to go to the grave with you, right? It's the only thing. Also, it is communication. I can't remember who said this. It's one of those um, famous clothing, um, uh, the, the, those leaders in the industry of fashion that, yeah, designers, but their name sounds like it, it could be a candy bar. You know, ones like Prada and Coco and... It's one of them. And they said that fashion is communication. Fashion is communication. As soon as you see what someone's wearing, it's communicating something. Clothes is important because it rep it's recommended to represent 5% of your income, you know, by those specialists that tell us how we should live and prosper and save and retire. 5% is a recommendation. I know for a fact I know a lot of people that it's way above that. It's also important because of the effect on their environment. 
11 million tons per year go into the landfills of clothing, just in the U.S. And billions of gallons of water, metric tons, are polluted with the clothing industry. So it's pretty important. So I want to go over the history of clothing. And when I was researching all of this information, I felt, in, I felt like a clothing archaeologist. And so I had to invent this timeline. You know, like we have AD and BC and pre-Columbian. And so I invented this timeline. We're going to go through the history of clothing, starting with pre-folia ficus. Pre-folia ficus. That's the time. So folia means leaf, and ficus means fig. So the time before the fig leaf and the time after. That's the history we're going to look at. So before the fig leaf, and everybody knows the fig leaf, right? Adam and Eve, they sinned, and then they got a fig leaf, okay? Before the sin in the Garden of Eden, Ellen G. White says that the clothing was a covering of light, of glory, of brilliance, just like the angels. That was the clothing before the fig leaf. In the Garden of Eden, before the fig leaf, there was no stress to dress. None. You didn't have to worry about combining and matching your clothes. Some people are great at matching clothes. I'm not going to say any names. <clears throat> but they match clothes for themselves, for others, for a whole department store. There was no stress in the cost. 5%, 10% of your income, the laundry, the cleaners, the detergent. There was no stress for storing it, for getting out the winter clothes, putting away the summer clothes. There was no stress for comparison in the form of, how do you compare clothes? Jealousy, criticism, greed, desire, none of that stress. And there was no stress to cover. There was no stress to cover, no stress to, you know, when Adam and, Adam and Eve sinned, their humanity's life was changed. But not only humanity, but the entire environment. All of a sudden, the plants developed thorns. The insects developed probisci that could penetrate skin and, and irritating hairs and bristles off of caterpillars and all kind of other animals. So the, your skin had to be covered. There was none of that before in the time pre folia ficus. Now, dun, 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 the dilemma, right? The sin, Adam and Eve sinned, and now there's a dilemma. And what does dilemma mean? It's a situation. What kind of situation? It's a problematic, it's a situation where you have to make a decision and none of the options are desirable. You have to make a decision, but you'd rather, none of the options are anything that you wish for or want. So that's a dilemma. So after post folia ficus, we got the first bathing suit, right? The fig, you just covered the important parts. But God knew that that's not going to last very long. When you start moving around and plowing the field and carrying the baby, you can't think. So then the history quickly evolved into skins, furs, leather, animal product. And unfortunately, that comes from some animals dying. And then it continued, the history continued into fabrics. Mankind started inventing ways to make clothes, maybe not so hot, not so sticky, not so heavy. So they got some leaves, weave them together. Yeah, remember that first fig leaf? Yeah, what if we cut them in strips? Yeah, and we do it like this. So then they had fabrics. And all of these clothes were made in the home. You couldn't go to the store and buy it. You couldn't order it online. It was made in the home. And guess who was making the clothes at the beginning? It was that one person, 
that didn't care much about social skills. It was that one person that didn't mind doing the same movement over and over again, stitching, weaving, hours and hours a day in one spot, and they put out the clothes for the family or the clan. And then the history continued to progress, and some ingenious people said, hey, what if I get my cousin to collect the cotton or the plants, my other cousin can get some sheep, my other cousin can stack it, my other cousin can dye it, my other cousin can boil it, and then we started getting the clothing industry where a group of people would do that and sell it to others or share it with others, maybe down the road or down the river. So now we had the homemade functional clothes, but now with tailor-made clothes, now we had fashion. And what's the difference between function and fashion? We see it all the time. Function, everybody has function. Everybody, when the wheel came out, everybody started using the wheel. When, when the hammer was invented, everybody started making hammers. That was functional. Everybody has it. Nobody cares how many you have, who had it first, who, who, who keeps getting it. But as soon as it goes into fashion, it's not functional anymore. Now it's fashion. Remember that first clue, I, one of the clues I gave? The less functional I am, the more I earn. Less functional clothes are expensive. You know, these, these celebrities that get married, they'll spend a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars on a dress. Does it have any function? It's all fashion. So as soon as you get to anything fashionable, it doesn't matter what it is, suddenly everybody wants to control it. And the only people that get to do that are the people that do law, that are in nobility, or that are in the church. And we're talking about history, but also history tends to repeat itself. So, medieval time, let's fast forward to medieval times. This is my favorite period when you study clothes because there's a lot of pictures, there's a lot of documentation, there's a lot of poetry all about clothes. So there were things like gugels, which is a pointy hat, and sometimes the point would all the way, go all the way to the floor. That is so cool. Imagine walking down the street and someone call you and you go like this. Yay! And, that, and then you had the crack house. Those are the pointy shoes. You know, during the, the pandemics and the plagues and, and the, the black death during the medieval times, certain uh, priests were preaching and accusing the men who wore crack owls because the toes were too long. It was the, the pointy parts were too long on the toes and their stockings were too tight. And that's why they had those plagues because Jesus was unpleased with how they were dressing. And then they had the, the, the coats with no sleeves. I love coats with no sleeves. I don't know what they're called, vests, but they had a different name back then. So he had all these cloaks and robes and hoods in the medieval time. But they were definitely controlling. It became a monopoly. It became, they made laws, they made um, regulations that judged, persecuted, and even segregated people. So there were actual laws that you could be punished severely if you wore a certain color that was reserved for royalty. Or if you wore a certain fabric that was reserved for the priest. And also, throughout history, many cultures have been persecuted and segregated and experienced genocide based on clothing. Think about it. During the, the Nazi occupation, Jews had to wear clothing with an emblem attached to their clothing. It had to be stitched on. If there were no clothing, could you tell the difference between a Nazi soldier and a Jewish soldier, assuming they had at least a fig leaf on? Could you tell the difference? Or females? No, you couldn't. The clothing was used in that sense. And throughout history, in our own community, there are still laws that are no longer enforced, but they're still on the books that made it illegal for a Chickasaw, a Choctaw, 
any, any Native American to wear their dress. They would be arrested. Their clothes would be confiscated, destroyed. And as history continues, we are now, everything we just talked about still exists in different parts of the world and even multiple uh, examples here in the U.S. But now we're in the era of body defamation. Clothing is used as body defamation. So what's the definition of defamation? Any, any of the kids here, or pre-law kids, or anybody took some law classes? I looked it up. There's three things you need for defamation. Number one, there has to be a lie, a untruth that's being created. Number two, it has to be spread, it has to be shared, it has to be promoted. And number three, it has to cause harm. So that's defamation. So how is the body being, how is defamation occurring with clothing? This is part of Satan's accomplishment. We, I have to compliment Satan. We don't like to compliment Satan, but we have to give him credit. He's doing a superb job in def defamation of God's image. We are all created in God's image. Adam and Eve, they were created in God's image. But as soon as we had the fig leaf dilemma, that first sin, what happened to God's image? Remember, it was covered with the brilliance of righteousness. As soon as there was sin, it disappeared. And then Adam and Eve went for a fig leaf and then the skins, and then the robes. So the image of God suffered defamation to the point that this is what we, what do you think about when you hear, hey, somebody was naked running down the street? Or, or little kids, you mention naked, and what's the first thing? <laughs> Start giggling, right? Or, or somebody's shirt is too high up and you see their tummy and the teacher's writing on the board and the tummy's there. All like, look at any part of the body. All of a sudden, the image of God suffers thoughts of repulsion, ridicule, humiliation, pornography, lust, abuse, infidelity, slavery, trafficking, manipulation, dementia criminalization. These are the things that the image of God, who are, we are created in, the, this is the result that comes from Satan's plan to defame God's name and his image. And he's, being, he's very successful. The other part of his accomplishment is replacement of self-worth and self-identity. There are persons at this very moment who rely on what they wear to give them any sense of life purpose. And they have to buy a new outfit. They have to redefine their fashion every single day. If they don't, they go into depression. They have to increase their meds and the clothing literally is robbing them of their self-worth and their identity because without the clothing, they're, they're nothing. They, they have no reason to live. And, and this is very, very sad. Uh, it, it affects our brothers and sisters not only mentally, but emotionally and physically as well to the point of their denying their own image that God made them in. So let's look at the industry. The, the industry of clothing is quite extensive. Uh, there's two categories. There's new clothing and then there's uh, repurposed clothing. And they're both very significant in terms of tonnage. They go, it goes by tons, how many tons per day up to 80,000 tons per day in the used clothing sector. Um, but they use different tests. Uh, two of the tests, the seam quality, the seam of the clothing seems to be the most important part 
of your attire. And they do tests to check the seam that gives you the quality of the clothing, the durability, uh, functionality. The other test that I really like is the arc test, where they shoot electricity across the clothing surface area to see how long before it penetrates the clothes to give you a burn. So those are tests that the clothing industry uses. But for our purposes, I want us to just focus on two things. All those tests describe uh, or give description and purpose. That's basically what they're saying. So, Ellen G. White, let's look at description and purpose for physical clothing, according to Ellen G. White. And these are just a few things I picked up. In regard to the esteem of husband and children, she describes that there were some ladies who were dressing, I'll just say, in work clothes when they were doing work around the house. But their work clothes was described as being able to frighten the crows away from the corn. And Ellen G. White suggests and recommends that even if we're working, we not wear such clothes. Because if we're at home, we have to respect our family members, what they're seeing, what the children are learning. And it's even more ironic that these same people, if a stranger is coming up to their porch or up their drive, they'll go and change into nice clothing. And Ellen G. White points out, why not do that for your own family, your wife, your children, your husband? She also comments on how the Lord commanded, and this is out of scripture, commanded the Israelites to wash their clothes and to put away filthy things because God was passing through their camp. And he is passing through our lives even today as we speak. More examples of, of physical clothes where I want you to think about description and purpose. The clothes should be neat and clean, plain and simple. It's interesting because when I looked at the hundreds or thousands of citations, I couldn't read them all, but I noticed that a majority were in her councils for youth and for children. She says on Friday, the clothes should be set out and prepared, not by the parents, but by the children under the, ch under the parents' instruction. And the clothing should be, the, they should get dressed without confusion, without rushing, and this was interesting, without hasty speeches. I knew exactly what that was, because I was guilty when my kids were little. Where are your socks? We put your shoes out Friday night, and you only got one shoe. Where, where's your bag of Legos? No, you cannot take a paper bag. We have a backpack for Legos on the Sabbath. I remember those hasty speeches. She also comments that we are not to conform to the fashions of the day, but still we're not to be indifferent in regards to our outward appearance. And our appearance should be pure both inside and outside of our being. Physical clothes from the Bible. The Bible points out lots of examples of kings and, and here's one specific example. In Luke, it's described, the man is wearing soft remnant. So what's, what's soft remnant? It's like silk maybe. And is gorgeously appareled. These are people in the king's court. Now, compare this with Mark, where a certain man's being described wearing camel's hair and a girdle of skin. What's a girdle of skin? It's a leather belt, right? So this man's wearing camel's hair and a girdle of skin. Do you think he's going to get entry into the court, the king's court, showing up at the door? I have a message from God. You think they're going to let him into the king's court? But think of the description and the purpose. Soft, gorgeously appareled, clo appareled clothes has a purpose in the king's court. Camel's hair and leather straps has a purpose when you're living in a cave, right? It, they have their purpose. The twin books, I call them the twin books. I'm sure some theologians here can give the proper term for the first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. I call them the twin books, there are repeated 
text, verses, descriptions of kings, messengers, prophets, prisoners of war, renting their clothes. Their clothes are rent and stripped. And what, in the Bible, why do people rent and strip their clothes and maybe throw some ashes on? What does that represent? Sadness, remorse, repentance. Um, and it's symbolic. It's amazing because without the clothes, there's nothing to hide. You, you know, you can be depressed. You can be a mass murderer. But as soon as you put on a suit, you can get anywhere. Another one of those quotes from one of those names that should be a candy bar. They said that clothing can get you anywhere if you wear the right clothing. <clears throat> Few more examples. Now we're going to go over spiritual clothing. Let's see what the inspired hand wrote about spiritual clothing. Many, many citations where we are to be clothed with humility. White, we're to be clothed in white linens of righteousness. We are to be clothed based on our character. This is spiritual clothing. When the second coming, the graves will open and we'll be clothed with immortality. Still talking about clothes. Spiritual clothes in the Bible. Remember the description and the purpose. Jesus said, I was naked, I was hungry, I was imprisoned, and you clothed me. And when they, and when they asked, what do you mean we clothed you? He said, you did it unto me. So there is a description and a purpose for physical or spiritual clothing. False prophets, Beware of false, prophet, pro, false prophets wearing sheep's clothing. Do you think they have sheepskins on? No. This is spiritual. And then in Revelation, many, many places where it says, we shall be clothed in white remnant. In Psalms, there are lots of scriptures that talk about the clothing of man. And not all of them are righteousness and salvation. You can also be clothed spiritually in shame, in guilt, in dishonor. God is mentioned in the Psalms as being clothed in majesty and clothed with strength. So in conclusion, we know that Satan made a plan, he contrived a situation that defamed the image of God. To this day, we all, I don't see anyone here displaying the image of God. Not a one of us. To this day and into the future, the image of God has been defamed where we must wear clothes until we are changed these garments for righteousness and immortality. But the invitation is there for all of us to regain that image of God. The invitation is there for those who've never heard before and never thought about this before. The invitation is there to take on the clothes that God had originally for us. I'm going to read the fine print at the bottom of this invitation. The King of Kings kindly requests that all guests adhere with the dress code that maintains the elegance, the integrity of eternal celebration. Proper attire is required for entry. Tailored ensembles are available due to the generous donation of this multi-billionaire, trillionaire king but it's upon request only, and it's for a limited time only. Bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your mercy and kindness. We praise you so much for that wonderful image and memory and history of how blessed it was to be in the Garden of Eden, 
with no stress to dress. And we look forward to that day when we can spend eternity clothed in your righteousness with the brilliance of salvation and eternal life. Please forgive us of our sins and bless us all as we depart from here and bless us as we change out of our Sabbath clothes that we will always keep our spiritual clothes. Please be with us all. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody.